Hey, want to see all the guitars, bass, keyboards, drums, microphones, and cool stuff we used to make this record? I'm Andrew Collier from Circuline, and this is the gear behind the music. Hey, this is Andrew Collier from Circuline, and for this gear behind the music segment, I want to talk about this piece of hardware, my Korg Kronos. I have had this, been using this Kronos since at least, two, I think I got this at the end of 2014 or 15, and it does uh, many things for me. Most importantly, I use my... Arturia Keylab 88 for the weighted action piano um, when I'm performing live, and you'll see that in another video. For the synth organ action, I use this Korg Kronos. It, it feels amazing. The, the feel is everything. It's I like butter. It just, it just feels fantastic. It's got a super cool combo XY joystick pitch bender. It's got a ribbon to slide around, and it also serves as an amazing backup just in case my computer rig goes down, I have thousands of sounds in here that I have used live and in the studio. Thanks to my friends at Korg, Jack Hotop and Eric Davis. Thank you so much, guys. You guys are awesome. It's got, you know, knobs and it's got sliders and it's got buttons and it's got the touch screen and it's got more buttons over here. It's got lots of lots of buttons. Anyway, it's got joysticks. Korg is a great company. They make great keyboards. I love my Korg Kronos. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Hi, this is Darren from Circuit Line. I'm here in the studio talking to you about some of the equipment that was used on our third record. This time I'm going to be talking about the mics that we used. These mics were used in our second record and as well as the third record here in our studio. I also use these for a lot of the YouTube videos that I have on my channel. They're really spectacular. As you can see, you can get precise placement on the drums and they sound great. Very pleased. Thank you. Okay, what's this again? Aston Microphone's portable halo microphone reflection filter. I'm not saying that. This is the big purple mushroom of life and audio happiness. Hello, this is Shelby from Circuline and on this episode of Gear Behind the Music, I'm gonna talk about my pedal board and what I've got going on and why I'm using the pedals that I've chosen and uh, why I like to keep it super simple. I want to talk about my very humble pedal board setup. It's really nothing too extravagant. It's very compact, very small. Kind of does the job. It doesn't really need to, need to be more than just this. Uh, I would have a tuner on the end. I don't have a tuner at the moment, but there would be a tuner there. <laughs> so the signal flow goes uh, straight out of bass into the compressor. And I really like playing with compressors because um, I feel like my playing is very dynamic. You know, I really like to pluck the string. I really like to hammer onto the string. But then there's bits where I'm playing quietly and getting that kind of that, that less aggressive tone is also important. And I want to be able to have the ability to have volumes kept under control. You know, if I were to aggressively pluck a string. I don't want that to blow everyone's ears off and I don't want to peak the recording. I don't want to clip the recording. So that's where this magical thing comes into play. And the reason why I got this, so this is the Empress uh, bass compressor. It's magical. I was very caught between getting this or the Kali 76 pedal because prior to getting this, what I would always use was 1176 type compressors in my DAW. But the reason I got this was because of the versatility and also I liked the fact that it had um, this LED meter reading so I could see just how much it was compressing the signal. You know, I wasn't just going off of, um, off of uh, what I was hearing. It also has this ability to add some tone and coloration to the, um, you can't see it, but there's, a list, there's this little, there's these two, well, there's this one knob here, which is labeled tone. And if I wanted to add a bit of a mid range boost or a, um, like a low mid dip, that gives me the ability to do that by just flicking it into position or I could just keep it off, which is in the middle position. You can get really aggressive with this. I've actually got it set to a 10 to one ratio at the moment, which means that any time it peaks over the threshold, the volume threshold that it's set to, it will um, it will do a 10 to one compression ratio on the signal, which is really squashing it down. You know, it means that any time I play anything that's really loud it's going to keep it under control <laughs> that's coming out of the so the so the signals then coming out of the compressor 
into this. So this is actually a recent addition. I didn't use this on the album, but I'm going to briefly talk about it anyways. I've had this pedal for a number of years, and what I would use it for in the past was um, back when I had my Moog Voyager, I used to have this set as uh, on the insert pathway on the Moog Voyager between the oscillators and the filters. Or was it between the filters and the envelope? Either way, I had, I had this set up in the insert path on the Moog Voyager, and it allowed me to add a bit more high end and a bit more low end like girth. <laughs> it's a choice of word to the signal before it went into uh, the, the rest of the signal chain in the Moog Voyager. And I found that this does an incredible thing to bass as well, especially when you're running the ding wall into this. Again, same principle. It just really controls the low end, but then adds this really nice, exciting top end. It's kind of a glorified EQ meets saturation distortion type pedal, but like high end distortion, upper end frequency distortion. And then after that, we're going into the Sansamp DI pedal, which is uh, just such an industry standard. I've got mine set, at least for the album, I had mine set for a very, very subtle bit of drive. It was barely doing anything other than just adding a little bit of crunch. And it's all I really needed. And I just kept it on for that kind of sound. But these days, I've actually got it set to do more. So it's, it's driving the signal more and I only really turn it on when I need it rather than keep it on all of the time, which is what I was doing in the past. And then we just XLR out straight into uh, straight into the desk. And that's it. Bing bong. That's the setup. That's the pedal board. Humble, simple. And it's all it, it's it's literally all I need. I don't need anything more than that. If I wanted to get more than this, I would put I would potentially get an octave pedal so I can do that really nice kind of Guy Pratt octave kind of vibe. And maybe I would play around with things like chorusing, but I just find stuff like that I prefer to do after the fact, you know, in, in terms of uh, overall sound production. I, I don't like to, I don't know, I kind of like, I don't really do that much to the bass tone other than this. Compression, bit of EQ, saturation, and then a bit of drive. I feel like I don't really need or want anything else. But there you go. Hello everyone, uh, Dave here. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about this guitar, which is a filed Oberon. This is a really nice guitar. I bought this in 1997 direct from uh, Roger Bucknell at Filed Guitars from his workshop based up in Penrith in Cumbria in England. I first heard one of these guitars when I was on tour with Iona and uh, we had a support act somewhere in the Manchester area, uh, a folk duo. Uh, and the guitarist was really good and he had one of these and I thought it was one of the best sounding acoustic guitars I'd heard. Also my friend Troy Donnickley um, around about the same time started playing one of these. So yeah, I went up to, to Roger, thanks thanks to an introduction from Troy, was able to try out a few guitars and just, just loved this one, uh, which they had in stock. But, uh, yeah, bro bought it very cheaply actually in 1997, it's worth uh, a lot more now, thanks to Roger not really making many guitars now. Yeah, filed. Roger started filed um, in 1973, and in fact they're celebrating their 50th anniversary this year. I was staying at my friend Troy's um, last week, and um, he'd just been to a surprise 50th anniversary birthday party for Roger, where um, Roger's wife Moira had invited lots of... Uh, the guitarists who'd used file guitars over the years to this uh, surprise birthday party. So uh, it sounded like it was a really great time. Anyway, uh, I've used this guitar on the Circuline track, Say Their Name, on the opening intro part and verse one, uh, where I thought it, some acoustic guitar picking might be nice. And this guitar, uh, it's not really great for kind of playing very fast acoustic stuff because it's got quite a wide neck, um, but that makes it perfect for uh, picking. Um, I tend to use a thumb pick, a metal thumb pick, and um, normally I'd have my, my fingernails a bit longer, but um, I've just been on tour with Life Signs, and uh, uh, when I'm playing keyboard in particular, the fingernails always get quite damaged, so I'm just using the um, fleshy part of the fingers at the moment. Uh, I like to use the, the nails because it's a, a brighter sound, but um, anyway, the tuning I used uh, on this track uh, was um, C, G, D, F, 
C, D, uh, with a capo at the second fret, which sounds something like this. And uh, I like using alternate tunings on uh, acoustic guitars in particular, just because of the sound, the open sound, and you can use more open strings, and uh, it's easy to come up with um, quite nice sounding chords that are slightly unusual. Uh, the reason I'm making that mistake is because I was, yesterday I was using a tuning which had the F tuned down to an E, uh, a semitone lower, <laughs> so I'm just getting a bit confused. sound uh, in that tuning. Actually this is the, I think it's the first time I've used this tuning. Uh, normally my go-to tuning for a lot of solo acoustic pieces is the one I just mentioned with the uh, the F tuned down to an E. So that would be C, G, D, E, C, D, uh, which is a very nice tuning. Um, so okay, uh, more on the equipment later on. So thank you. Can I just say that every studio needs a lazy boy? That I've got involved, uh, oh, let me say that again. <laughs> what am I trying to say here? Uh, what is the signal flow? It's been a while. And then I think we come out of this. Uh, give me a second. <laughs> you can edit this out. Okay, hopefully that's, <laughs> that one was a little bit wobbly. <laughs> if you're hearing any jingling, it's, it's the boy who is down here. You can see his tail. <laughs> yes. It's the big mushroom of life and sound. Aston Microphone's portable halo microphone reflection filter. No, what? No. We're going to do that again. Wait, stop it.